this week's sermon with Jim Nave at Fiddletown Church. Now, as I prayed about what to speak about this week, the Lord really impressed upon me that we needed to talk more about power and authority. We need to understand what it means. Because I grew up in a tradition that said that power and authority died with the apostles. And there's many other beliefs that don't emphasize or even talk about what Jesus said about power and authority. Right? So it died off with the apostles. There's no, no, no need for it today. There's no need for the miraculous. There's no need for the supernatural. It's just, it's all, it was just part of what happened in the early church to kind of get it, the, the fledgling church going. And then there's no need for it today because we have a Bible. That's one of the major things that have been taught. But see, here's what I have to ask myself. When I hear the words of Jesus, should I discount what he says or ignore what Jesus says because it goes against my traditions? Should we? I mean, seriously. So last week, we talked about how Jesus equipped the church to continue his ministry. And that the goal of all this was that people would see his nature. That the nature of God would be revealed to the church. And we talked about how he used power and authority. That he gave the church his power and authority in order for his nature to be revealed in the church. Now... As I prayed about what to speak about this week, the Lord really impressed upon me that we needed to talk more about power and authority. We need to understand what it means. Because I grew up in a tradition that said that power and authority died with the apostles. And there's many other beliefs that don't emphasize or even talk about what Jesus said about power and authority. Right, so it died off with the apostles. There's no, no, no need for it today. There's no need for the miraculous. There's no need for the supernatural. It's just, it's all, it was just part of what happened in the early church to kind of get it, the, the fledgling church going. And then there's no need for it today because we have a Bible. That's one of the major things that have been taught. But see, here's what I have to ask myself. When I hear the words of Jesus, should I discount what he says? or ignore what Jesus says because it goes against my traditions? Should we? I mean, seriously. Because it does it, it because it hasn't been our experience or it hasn't been our tradition, so many times we just throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? We don't study to find out what the word of God means. If Jesus says it, he's the founder of the church and it's important to him. Can we get that? He's the founder of the church. He, he's the one who died so that everything that we experience in our life is available. So we have to take his word seriously. We have to find out what he means by this. So we're going to go back to Genesis again. Now, you guys read this a lot, your notes, and you don't read your Bible. But I was, you probably, your Bible would probably open to Genesis 1 if you brought it every, 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 day, every Sunday, right? Because we go there a lot, but that's a good thing. So what I want to do, he... So in Luke 9, 1, it says he called his 12 disciples together and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. So a disciple is a learner, a follower, or one who abided in his word and believed upon and accepted him as Lord and Savior. Is there anyone here that falls into that category? That should be all of us, right? We're all disciples of Christ. So the word power comes from the Greek word dynamis, or maybe it's dunamis. I didn't, I'm not a Greek scholar, but it's, it's one of those words. And it means miraculous power, might, or strength. So what English word do you think comes from that word, dynamis? Dynamite. It's dynamite. Anyways, for you people that grew up in the 80s, dynamite. Um, the word authority 
it means delegated power, legal right, or access. So he's saying that he gave the church legal right or access to operate in the power of God because God's plans are going to require his power to be fulfilled. That is what Jesus is telling us. So again, I think one of the challenges that we have is for me growing up, this whole power and authority thing, again, it's not for today. And the, t the thinking is, well, what happened is in the early 1900s, there was, um, there was an outpouring, some people called it the, the charismatic movement. So during the, the charismatic movement of the early 1900s, they took this and adopted this as their own doctrine. So we see power and authority, and so many people, when they think of power and authority, they think of it as a charismatic doctrine, and not the words of Jesus. It's not just a charismatic doctrine, it's the words of Jesus. And, and it didn't start even with Jesus, it started in Genesis. So did Genesis, is, did that precede the 1900s with the charismatic movement? Yeah, so it was a foundational part of God's plan for the earth, is for man to operate in authority. So we have to understand that. So Genesis 1.26, Then God said, Let us make a man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God's plan was that mankind would receive his nature, which is his image, and then reveal his nature, which is likeness. Right? So his plan was that we would be the living expressions of God on the earth. But then it also says that he gave, gave man dominion over the earth. So God's plan was that he would work through man on the earth. So he gave man a dominion, and the word dominion means authority. And the word authority means delegated power. So when God wanted to fulfill his plans on the earth, he chose to do it through man. He delegated his power to hu humankind or mankind on the earth to accomplish it. Now this is a review, but we need to understand this. So we talked about the source of power. So what's the source of power? Is there many sources of power? There's one source of power, and it's God. Right? Nobody else has the power but God. And, and we find out how he released his power. He released his power through his spoken word, right? Everything that we see came about through the words of God. God spoke everything into creation. So Hebrews 11.3 says, Faith empowers us to see that the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God's word. He spoke, and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. So God spoke. He released his faith through his words, and creation happened. But then it also goes on to say that not only was everything created by the word, but it says that everything is sustained by the word of his power. Now think about that. That means that everything is held together by the word of God's power. So this is what it says in Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, it's talking about Jesus, and holding all things by the word of his power. And when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of God in majesty on high. So it says that, that the word of his power is upholding everything. So I want you to think about that. He gave a command for light to be one time. Think about that. He doesn't have to set his alarm clock and get up every morning at three and say, hey, son, don't forget to come up. Right? Because he gave one command. And with that command, everything holds together. And nothing is going to change unless he changes that command. Because everything is held together by the word of his power. There you go. I was pausing for, for an amen. So I gave you a couple other verses because it also confirms that God's plan was to use man on the earth to fulfill his plans. So Psalm 115.16 speaks of this also. The heavens, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So yes, God is the source of all power, no doubt about it. Right? Nothing can be done without him. But his sovereign plan was to, to work through people. 
So Psalm 8, 4 through 6 says it again. Why would you bother with such puny mortal men or care about human beings? Yet what honor you have given to men, created only a little lower than Elohim, crowned with glory and magnificence. You have delegated to them rulership over all you have made with everything under their authority, placing the earth itself under the feet of your image bearers. Did he pull any punches? Did the psalmist? The Holy Spirit wrote this. Is this pretty clear to you? Of what his plan was? That he was going to rule the earth through humans. Right? I'm a spirit. I can't be seen. So I'm going to put my spirit inside of you and my power is going to flow through your spirit to the earth. That was God's plan. He didn't change it. Man's changed their view, their view of it, but God's plan hasn't changed. There you go. So, <clears throat> but here's the part that I thought about this week. Do you think that God knew that Satan wanted to destroy his plan and usurp the authority that God gave to man and use his deception to steal, kill, and destroy? You th he knew that, right? He's all-knowing. So he knew that in advance. So power and authority was part of God's plan, and the power and authority is always used to restore God's plan and simultaneously destroy the works of the devil. Right? If you destroy the works of the devil, you reveal God's plans. Right? So from Genesis 1, the plan was, I give you authority over him. The authority is not over people. People are not the problem. The problem is that we have an enemy, right? And he's a supernatural being, and if we think we can defeat him in natural power, we're fooling ourselves. We're fooling ourselves. So God gave us what we needed to take over or take back the authority that he intended for us to have in the first place. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, they gave the authority that God gave to them over to the enemy. And he became the God of this world. And now he's the one that has the authority. He's the one that has the greatest influence. He's the one who's training up people to think the way that he thinks. And God's plan was never that we would live that way. So from the very beginning, he set us up so that we could deal with this and have a victory. So we see this power and authority being used all through the Bible. We've talked about this multiple, multiple times. So we looked at it with the story of the Exodus. Right, and how he used his authority through Moses. And we have to understand, the, the whole story of Egypt and the Passover, it's all a picture of the Christian life. It's, it's, a, it's a picture of us coming out of darkness into the kingdom of light. So that, that whole thing is just a prophetic picture of what would happen when Jesus came. Right? So Egypt was the world that we are living in now. And people are living in bondage. Pharaoh represented Satan. He's the one who was keeping the people in bondage. Moses represented Jesus, the deliverer. The promised land is life in the kingdom. So all of that was just a picture of what we, the life we would have. Right? So the Old Testament is just types and shadows, and they're all pointing to Jesus. And that's what this story is all about, is pointing to Jesus, is pointing to what would happen so that we could be delivered from the dominion of darkness. Right? So when, when God comes and he hears the cries of his people, he doesn't come and work apart from them. Right? He could have done it himself. He's all-powerful. But it would violate the covenant he made with, made with man. He could have just spoke to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh would have had to obey. He would have fallen into a puddle of whatever, right? If God speaks to you, it's, it's over, right? You're not going to say, oh, think about it, right? <laughs> That's not how it works, right? But he chose to work through man. So he came to Moses and, and he encouraged Moses and he said, this is what we're going to do. And you see this story and we've read it multiple, multiple times. But see, we have to understand how this worked, right? So Psalm 105, 26 to 28 just sums this up. So this is, this is David King David, and he's, he's basically telling us a summation of what happened in Egypt. And he says, but he sent them his faithful servant Moses, the deliverer, and he chose Aaron to accompany him. And it says, their command brought down signs and wonders, working miracles in Egypt. And then it goes on to tell us how he did it. By God's direction, they spoke 
and released the plague of thick darkness over the land. So this describes how God intended for everything to work, right? He's the, he directs, man obeys, God releases his power to fulfill his promise. It's the story of the Bible. It's from Genesis to Revelation. It has not changed. God speaks, God directs, man obeys, God releases his power. And we see that all through the Old Testament. We've talked about it before. We talked about it was, it was, it was, at, it was at Moses' command that the Red Sea parted, right? It wasn't his power. He couldn't have done it without, without God. But God couldn't have done it without Moses because it required his obedience to flow. And we saw that all through, all through the Old Testament. You see God working through Joshua, right? It, it, God did not speak to the walls of Jericho and, and blow them down like the big bad wolf story. That's not how it worked, right? He gave the command to his people, and when his people did what he said, the wall came down. They had to do their part, and God worked through their obedience. So now... We, we're going we're gonna to fast forward to Jesus. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, but I want you to, to, to hear this. So why did Jesus come? It tells us two different reasons why he came, and they kind of work together. John said in John 1, 29, and he's, now he's talking about John the Baptist. He, he says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus came to take away sin, and that was the whole issue that humanity had, right? Sin entered into the world, separated man from God's plan, his nature, everything fell apart because of sin. So it says that Jesus came to take it away. And if you take it away, what are you left with? God's plan, right? But then it also kind of gives you a, a, a second view of it. In 1 John 3, 8, it says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested or made known, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Right? So in destroying the works of the devil, what you're left with is God's plan. So it was just a, it was a two-sided coin that Jesus came to do. Now Jesus tells us how he did it, so there's no question about it. In John 14, 10, he says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The works I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father residing in me performs his miracle, miraculous deeds. So what he's saying is, God is the one who initiated everything. Right? He's the one that's directing me. And then when I walk in obedience, it's the power of God flowing through me that is, that is allowing me to accomplish my plans and purposes on the earth. It was really simple. Is that what Jesus is saying here? Am I adding anything to it? This is what Jesus is saying. So now we have to ask ourselves, are we disciples? Followers, learners? One of the ones who've chosen to follow him. Because he goes on to say this, that we are to do the same things he did. And, and what we have to understand is he equipped us. Right? We talked a couple weeks ago that God gives you never gives you an assignment that he hasn't empowered you first to do. Right? He never gives man an assignment that he hasn't already equipped you to do. So listen to what it says about you and me. This is talking about every person who's born again. So Ephesians 1, 19 through 20. This is Paul praying that we will get a revelation of what we already have. So he says, I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. Right? So Paul is saying, I want you to understand what God has already given you. The moment you got born again, this is what you received. And then it says, and then once you understand that, then your life will be an advertisement of this immense power as it works through you. And then it explains the source of the power. This is the mighty power that was released when God raised Christ from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor and supreme authority in the heavenly realms. And now he is exalted as first above every ruler, authority, government, realm of power and existence. So is Jesus the one in authority? He sits at the right hand of God and it says he is the one that has authority over everything in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth. So is there any question that Jesus is the one in, in all authority? None. There shouldn't be any question about that, right? He is the one that has all power and he has all authority. 
So now Luke 10, 19, he's talking to his disciples. And he says, now you understand that I have imparted to you all my authority to trample over his kingdom. He's talking about Satan. You will trample upon every demon before you and overcome every power Satan possesses. Absolutely nothing will be able to harm you as you walk in this authority. Right? So he tells us that he's given us authority, he's given us power, and the purpose of it is to destroy the works of the devil. It's not about people. It's not about us trying to have dominion over people and rule people. It's about helping yourself be free and helping other people live free. Live in the abundant life that God intended for us to have. So the question for us is this. What was God's plan? What was the key? How did he intend for us to release this power? How did he intend for us to release this authority? So in John 14, 12, he's talking to disciples, us, the church. And he says, I tell you this timeless truth. The person who follows me in faith, believing in me, will do the same mighty miracles that I do. Did he make that pretty clear? And then he says, even greater miracles than these because I go to be with my father. For I will do whatever you ask me to do when you ask me in my name, and that is how the Son will show what the Father is really like and bring glory to him. Ask me anything in my name, and I will do it for you. So there's a couple things we have to understand about this. So first of all, he talks about following him in faith. So when he talks about following him in faith, what he's saying is you have to do it the way that I did it because that's how the Father taught me to do it. And how did Jesus do it? He heard from the Father, he did what the Father said, and he trusted God with the results. So Jesus is saying, if you want to do it, there's only one way to do it. You can't do it your own way. You've got to do it the way God says. Hear from him, obey him, trust him. Trust and obey. But then he also talks about believing in him. Well, we just saw in Ephesians 1 what the Bible says about him, that he's the one that's in the place of authority. So what he wants you to believe is he's the one, not you, not me. He's the one that's in the place of all authority. That everything in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth is under his authority, right? He's the ruler over everything, right? And every knee shall bow to him. That's what he wants us to believe. So that's a pretty important statement, right? Then we also have to understand Two more things. One of them is this word, ask. See, we live in a culture that has a very simple language, and ask pretty much means to what? Request. Right? So when you think of the word ask, you think request. Well, that's, that is found in the Bible. But Greek words have different meanings, and right here he's not talking about asking. This word here means command. It means command. Because what he's saying is, you have to understand, he just talked about how he was doing the works of his father in the previous verses, right? He did the works of the father by doing what Jesus said to do. So what he did was, when he came across something that wasn't of God, he would just command it to leave, right? He wasn't asking his father. You don't see anywhere where he asked his father to cast out a devil. Do you? He, he spoke to it. He, whatever it had to go, he spoke to it. He talked about mountains, and he says, you speak to the mountain. So this word means to command. Now, there are places where it does talk about asking, and it means to ask, like we think of asking. You're praying, you're asking, you're having, a, you're having a conversation with God, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about exercising authority. That's how he did what he did. He exercised authority. That is exactly what the, the centurion said that he saw, right? And that's why God said that he had more faith than anybody, right? Because he understood the word, the power of the word and the authority of the word. So he saw Jesus operating in authority and God said that he's the one with the greatest faith because he saw how Jesus was doing it. But see, here's the last thing we have to understand is, is the name of Jesus. What is he saying? Whatever you ask, whatever you command in my name, I will do it. He's telling us that the name of Jesus is our power of attorney. 
That's how we were designed to release his power in the name of Jesus. I struggled for a long time because I, I, I would understand, you could see clearly power and authority, but I couldn't, how, are they, how is it being released? I mean, there's got to be something that I'm not seeing. And then I realized it was through the name of Jesus. See, when they commanded, the, you never heard them commanding anything without saying the name of Jesus. But see, they understood something that most of us don't understand. We've, get, we've gotten used to that's how we just close our prayer. But they understood that, that that's where the authority lied. The authority lied in the name of Jesus. So you'll see that as you go through the New Testament, as you see these disciples doing what God called them to do. So when you look at Jesus having these conversations with his disciples, and we have to understand, when Jesus was, was working for three and a half years with his disciples, he was training them to continue his ministry on the earth. That's what he was doing. He was training them to continue what he was doing. And some pe people, they just think, well, no, he was, that all, you know, that's not what he meant. He never intended for you to keep doing that because he's God. He did everything as God. But, but listen to what he's saying when he's talking to his people. So Jesus had come across this fig tree, and the fig tree had no fruit on it. And some of the translations say it was out of season. So they wonder why was Jesus not happy with this fig tree out of season? But I want you to think about this. If the creator of the universe created you to bear fruit and he's hungry, what should you be doing? Bearing fruit. You get it? Jesus is the creator of all things. And if he's hungry, you better start popping out some figs. That's really what this is about. Jesus shows up and he's like, I'm here. And all he saw was leaves. He's like, you're not fulfilling my purpose. You're not bearing fruit. Jesus is never happy when what he created doesn't bear fruit. And that's what it was about. It wasn't bearing fruit. So he spoke to the fig tree. Now that must have been pretty shocking, right? To have the, him speak to a tree and then have it wither from the roots up. But listen to his response to the disciples who were there. They, they, went, they, they went to Jerusalem, they came back, and the tree was dead. And I want you to see what happens here. So Peter says, Jesus! You know, we, we, don't, we can't hear what was going on. We can't hear the language. But Peter wasn't like, Jesus, did you see the fig tree is dead? Right? He was probably pretty excited by this. Like, Jesus, do you see the fig tree that you spoke to? It's dead, right? And Jesus is like, have faith in God. What do you mean? After all you've seen, that shocks you, right? But listen to this. So Jesus answered them and said to them, assuredly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what is done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. So was Jesus saying, don't try this at home? Is that what Jesus, because that's what most people believe. Like every time Jesus did a miracle, one of the disciples came up with a disclaimer, says, this is Jesus. Like the car commercials, right? Don't try this at home. This is a, a, a professional driver on a closed course. But is that what happened here? Jesus is saying, I'm going to leave you with a baton, Right? And I have a plan, and there's all these people that are hurting, and you have the answer. Here's how it's going to work. You're going to speak, because I'm giving you my authority. So here's the key. Here's what kind of brought it all together for me. One, one day I was in my office, and I was reading through the book of Luke, and, and it hit me. So he sends these 70 disciples out. First he sends his, his 12 then he sends out his 70 missionaries, and it says, when, when the 70 missionaries returned to Jesus, they were ecstatic with joy, telling them, Lord, even the demons obeyed us when we commanded them in your name. So they understood what Jesus was saying. Commanded them in your name. So what is the command? The command is just faith-filled words. It's saying what Jesus said. It's saying what God told Jesus to say. 
right? What did Jesus say when he saw somebody who was demon-possessed? Get out. Bye. You have to leave, whatever, right? And all they were doing is saying what Jesus was saying, which is what God told him to say. And the command was to say what God said. And when they said what God said, in the name of Jesus, and they believed in the power of Jesus' name, whatever was the obstruction, whatever was the mountain, what choice did it have? No choice. It was not up to debate. They had to leave. So that was God's plan for the church. So we see this again with Peter. So in Acts 3, 6 through 7, he's on his way into the temple to pray, and he comes across this beggar, and the beggar is asking for money. And Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. And then what did he say? In the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he's asking for money. Jesus, Peter was saying, I don't have any money with me. He's not saying he's broke. That's one of the problems we have is we think that means that we're supposed to be broke. He was just saying, I'm married and my wife has the money. Right? Like, that was funny, Linda. <laughs> But what did he have? He had authority. So he gave him what he had. He gave him what he had. So the people marveled and wanted to know how Peter performed the miracle. Could you imagine that? Wouldn't they want to know that? Would they want to know how this happened? I mean, these are people who had been passing by this guy for probably decades. Once a week, this guy's always there. He's a staple. Every time, you know he's going to be there. And all of a sudden, he's up running around shouting, Praising the Lord. And he wanted to know what happened. And Peter was very, very, he didn't pull any punches. He said, Jesus' name has healed this man. And you know how lame he was before. Faith in Jesus' name, faith given us from God, has caused this perfect healing. He didn't take credit for it. He didn't say, check me out. This is awesome. Look at me go with my bad self. He, it, was, it was Jesus. It was the name of Jesus is what he said. Now, he, he goes and he stands before the Sanhedrin because when this happens, they're not happy. Right? Because now they lose 4,000, 5,000 members in a day. That's a bad day for the church, right? So now the, all the, the Sanhedrin, all the Pharisees, all the religious rulers are like, we've got to stop this. Right? They're gonna, this is going to go really bad. Right, so they try to figure out a way to do this. So they call him in. They call Peter and John in to try to find out what happened and then how to stop it. And then in verse 10, 410, Peter says, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole by the name of Jesus. So, do they have an understanding now of what happened, do you think? The religious leaders, they would have heard the people say it because the people heard what happened and how it happened, right? But now they heard it straight from Peter. And Peter wanted to make sure they understood what was happening. It was the name of Jesus. It was the power of the name of Jesus. By that name and that name alone, this happened. This man is free because God never intended him to be in bondage. So, so here's the part that just, it just blows me away. So they come up with an idea to stop them. Right now, they got to do something to stop Peter and the early church. Because they realize, wait a minute, things are about to change. Because there's something different about their message compared to ours. Right? They're starting to put it all together that, hey, this whole thing with Jesus is real. Right? And, and, and we're about to see something completely different. So we got to stop this now. Right, so they, they, they call Peter back in after they have their, their meeting and they tell him this. They called them and communicated and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. 
So he didn't say stop teaching. He didn't say stop speaking. You could say whatever you want. You could preach whatever you want. Just don't do it in the name of Jesus. Why is that? Because they saw the results. Every time the name of Jesus was invoked, something changed because the power of God was released through the name of Jesus. But see, I love Peter's response. And my prayer is that it'll be my response and everyone's response at some point. So this is Acts 4.19. But Peter and John answered to them and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. But listen to this. For we cannot but speak of the things which we have seen and heard. See, they spent three and a half years with Jesus seeing and hearing. They didn't just hear sermons, right? They heard a sermon and then they saw a demonstration of what, of what Jesus was talking about. And it was the demonstration along with the preaching that changed him. What was Peter saying? It's too late. It's too late for me, buddy. You, you can't, there's nothing you do now. I've seen too much. I've experienced too much. I've seen too many people set free. You're too late for me. Try them. But for me, it's too late. That's what Peter was saying. You're wasting your time with me, friend. You're wasting your time with me. I've seen it, experienced, been there, done that, and nothing is going to keep me from doing this. This is why I am here. And one of the hardest things, I think, is to help people understand that the supernatural is supposed to be natural for the church. See, the, the devil has convinced us that the supernatural is weird and mysterious. So we're just like, mm, whoa, that's weird. I heard that's weird. Right? So we just want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But see, Jesus taught supernatural things to the church because that's how he intended for people to be set free. And he didn't intend for it to be weird. It wasn't weird when Jesus ministered to people. It wasn't. People were happy to be around him. It wasn't weird. I, one of my, the pastors I listened to a lot was talking about when he first became a pastor, he had a small church and he would have the youth help him with doing the offering. And they always sang, uh, what did they call that? Doing the offering, they always sang a song. Praise whom, from whom all blessings flow. What's the name of it? Doxology. Praise him, all creatures here below. And then always in his, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And he looked over at one of the boys about 10. His eyes were really big. He says, son, are you okay? He goes, I'm afraid of ghosts. <laughs> but see, that's what the enemy wants us to do when it comes to understanding God's plan for the church. He wants us to look at these things and say, well, I'm afraid of ghosts. I'm afraid of those things. I don't want to be part of those things. But see, we are supposed to be adhering to Jesus, who's our Lord. We're not supposed to be trying to get him to submit to our ways. We're supposed to be submitting to his ways. And that's the only thing, that's the only way that we are going to do what God called us to do. We have to submit to his ways. We've been trying to get God to, do, to, to come down to our level for hundreds of years and it's not working, right? We got to do it the way he says to do it, right? We've been convinced that it's, you're just a man. You, you got, you, just let it go. Man, it'll be okay when you get to heaven. But let me read to you what the Bible says you have. So God gave the church his power, his authority, his word, his armor, his spirit, his anointing, his wisdom, his gifts, his nature, the name of Jesus, a better covenant, and the keys to the kingdom. Do you think we're like equipped? Is there anything else that we're supposed to be waiting for? 
There's nothing else. He's just waiting for our obedience. That's all he's waiting for is our obedience. Everything that we could ever need for life and godliness has already been given to us. That is what the Bible is telling us. That's a good list right there. The keys to the kingdom have been given to the church. 